Uh, recently, last week, the Toronto Star had on its front page this, this article that you see there, um, which describes uh, an artist in Ottawa whose name is Jonathan Hoban, who, who opened a very controversial exhibit of photographs of children uh, staged. It's, those are staged photographs of children playing in scenes of, um, you know, uh, de depicting really horrific scenes. So. Um, there were several of children playing at Abu Ghraib. <clears throat> Since I've you know, written on Abu Ghraib, I was you know, very taken by this. There were also children playing in Katrina. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that there were no children playing on scenes of violence against Aboriginal people, so that's interesting. Wh which violence do you feel you can you know, depict and which you don't want to talk about? But. Um, so the artist, you know, faced a lot of criticism and uh, he insisted that we shouldn't shelter our children when we see Abu Ghraib, our children see Abu Ghraib, so we shouldn't shelter them. And anyway, the kids had a lot of fun, that's what he said. Uh, other people said art is art, but uh, for someone like me, you have to stop and think about how something like this works as a pedagogy, because the artist is saying that he wants us to think something from this. What does he want us to think? And I, I wanted to use it to introduce um, what is something that is at the moment is a hypothesis, and I'm a little surprised um, that I've been facing some opposition to this hypothesis, and that is that social responses to torture um, have been uh, changing and, and people are becoming more comfortable with the idea of torture and more approving of it. Uh, I, I, w I really would love to go out on a limb and say, you know, it's for the longest time it hasn't been the case that large numbers of people see torture as something states do and um, approve of it. There is, you know, I teach on racial violence and I write on racial violence and I know that they're all related. So I don't, I haven't, uh, got time to think about how attitudes to torture are related to attitudes to the torture of women in pornography or violence against uh, Aboriginal peoples. So for now, I just want to say that my focus is that the torture of Muslims and Arabs and Iraqis and Afghanis and Middle Easterners and anybody who looks like them is really what I'm uh, focusing on. And I'm concerned that it's not only that uh, people in the West increasingly like to see torture, act it out, play with it, uh, stick pictures of it on their fridge doors as Canadian soldiers did of the torture they did in Somalia, watch shows like 24 and so on. It, it, it's not only in the realm of popular culture that we can trace it, but uh, perhaps more importantly it's in the realm of law. People are increasingly comfortable with the idea that it is necessary to torture some people. And official, that is to say, sort of, you know, governmental or legislative responses to this have been the clearest indicator yet that these attitudes are in fact hardening. Torturers have not gone punished or if they faced punishment, it's been very light, usually the, the rank and file, but no one above the rank of sergeant, for example, at Abu Ghraib. Um, and, and in another paper that I wrote, torturers have even attracted sympathy. Um, and so I am uh, wanting to think about how torture works as a pedagogy, teaching us what kind of world we live in and what kind of world we want. But as you can imagine, it's never straightforward about pedagogy. When, when you look at that, some people will say, or perhaps the artist will, would even say this, that you, know, you don't know how learning works. So watching a child play with torture might just be jarring enough for you to think critically at the end of it. So you know, that's what some people argue. Other people argue that certain kinds of horrors or tremendous violence really are not teachable. <laughs> through this kind of, of mechanism. I, I happen to be one of those people just in a kind of instinctive way because I, I can't for a minute imagine 
that we would allow mock concentration camps where kids got to play at gassing Jews. In fact, Prince Harry didn't even get away with wearing insignia, Nazi insignia at a, at a costume party. And certainly for me, uh, watching this, what is meant to be, I suppose, a, a parody, I realized that you know, this story is not working for me. <laughs> this is raising for me uh, memories of Abu Ghraib, the real Abu Ghraib. And if you look at the real Abu Ghraib, sorry, it's also raising memories for me of Canadian torture of Somalis. So, you know, I asked myself what the picture that's the cover of my book, what's the difference between that and, you know, what the artist has, has done? Well, the difference is that this is real. <laughs> this is a picture of what Canadian soldiers did. In, in Somalia. So, and then if you look at this picture, I hate showing pictures, I don't show pictures of Abu Ghraib and I tried to show sort of one that was intentionally blurred. But if you focus on Lindy England in this picture, it is as though she's in a game. And certainly the soldiers describe themselves as in some sort of a game at Abu Ghraib. And then political analysts like, uh, and politicians, people like James Schlesinger, said that it was really all it amounted to was animal house on the night shift. So the thing that makes me really worried about, you know, these, these sorry, this, this kind of thing is that it, it, it brings back the sensation that in fact, for some people, real torture is a kind of game, and the lesson you don't get from this, no matter how hard you try pedagogically, is any lesson about the humanity of the tortured. You never learn anything about them. So these kinds of moments in popular culture, but also the very real moments where we authorize torture or we support it or we endorse it in some way, these things are pedagogies because they teach us what kind of country we live in and who we are and who's to count and who doesn't count. So all of this is, believe it or not, only an introduction, so I have to talk really fast now. So <laughs> all of this is by way of trying to think about our role in Afghanistan in the torture of Afghan detainees. And if I'm going to... Um, take you very quickly, you would have had to have been asleep for the last couple of years not to, to know some of these details, but on the other hand, it's been amazing the way in which Canadians have not had a strong collective outcry saying, you know, we don't, we don't support this. Um, so torture in Afghanistan, as you know, the, uh, actually was in the Globe in 2007 where uh, a reporter reported that face-to-face -face interviews with detainees uh, who were detained by Canadian soldiers and then sent to Kandahar jails, with, which were run by Afghanistan's National Directorate of Security, revealed that torture was rampant, that it was so rampant that it, it's pretty impossible to think that the Canadians knew nothing about it. So that's our scandal in effect. And the government, of course, protested, but while it was protesting, it was systematically blocking anybody finding out any information about it. So. I'm, and that's still going on. So I'm really concerned with um, ordinary Canadians. Now it seems that my hypothesis about rising social approval for torture is wrong. If you follow that uh, a CanWest poll, they polled a thousand Canadians, but you know, those statistics people could, could quarrel. So they polled them and it seems that two thirds of them thought that torture had occurred and that it was wrong. And that if we have the proof that the Canadian government knew that, that uh, somebody should be punished for this. So this appears to be what most Canadians think. I thought to myself, how, how odd, I had no idea. And one in five, you know, often the sort of attitude, this kind of thing happens in war, what can you do? You know, the shrug. But most people, it seems, two thirds at least, said that, you know, this is wrong, this is bad, we don't support it. So when I read that, I thought, whew, there goes my hypothesis. Canadians really care. They think torture is wrong. And so let me just ask for a quick show of hands. How many of you think that the Harper government would fall if tomorrow we had even more proof than we already do that they were uh, complicit in torture in Afghanistan? How many people think they would fall? How many think Canadians would be outraged and say, enough? None of you, <laughs> okay. I agree with you. I think nothing's going to happen to them. And 
that's worth thinking about in terms of a pedagogy, that you could have a nation full of people, two thirds of whom say torture is wrong, we don't like it, it's bad, we don't want to do it, and still support the government that knew about it and followed it. So how deep does it go, you ask? That's a question that we really need, need to ask. And so in asking that, I thought it's, it's very useful to remember that torture itself is a narrative. What, what torture does is it writes, as Elaine Scarry beautifully put it, and I know from Rick that several of you study Elaine Scarry, it's still the most uh, amazing piece of work. Torture is a story of power that you write on someone's body. So torture itself is a story. And more importantly, for my purpose, torture is also a story of power that you write on the social body. If your government is doing it, or is approving of it, that is writing a story of power on us. And so it's worth thinking about this story of power. I, I, I love the way that Marnia Lazaric put it. She studied uh, the torture of Algerians by the French in the Algerian War for Independence. She said, torture in Algeria functioned as a source of social integration. It literally binds people in a common story. In Algeria, it united the government, the military, and it turned the state into a militaristic institution. So I think what we need to think about most as Canadians is whether, in fact, torture, our best feelings notwithstanding, it would seem, is somehow binding us and turning us into a militaristic state, um, turning us in, into a nation of people that in the end, we'll let torture happen, or we'll do it ourselves. So what is the story of power? Well, I want to first think about the story of power and then ask about how that story seduces us so that we feel we belong in it, even though we have these attitudes about torture, that it's wrong. The story of power is the story of a militarized globe, and it's been the story of the West in the war on terror. As you know, that uh, torture, either doing it or facilitating it, such as in the rendition of Meher Arar, uh, you know, those kinds of things have, if Canada acquiesces in it, it provides us with membership in the club. We get to be one of the Western nations, the boys. The United States implication is to torture has been demonstrably more direct. I mean, it's so direct that you know, there was a direct telephone line between the torture room um, and President Bush. I mean, that's pretty direct. You will notice that there's been no responsibility there. Of course, we have our own responsibility, so we shouldn't relax about this, because although it's a bit hard to pin down, what did our prime minister know, or what did our parliament know about Maher Arar? So, Torture has been a feature of the war on terror, and as again Scary and Elaine Scary in a, in a recent piece, a recent book argued, because there is an international prohibition against torture in international law, it, it's so absolute, you're not allowed to torture, that when you have a regime that is actually participating in it and authorizing it in some way, then you actually have utter contempt for the rule of law. You have lawlessness.